So to kick off the week of um, visualization and fitting, let me uh, start out by showing you uh, a case study based on this paper here. Uh, as you can see, it's from the Journal of Recreational Mathematics uh, from 1997. Uh, it has to do with balancing uh, Lego towers. Uh, so the author, uh, Watson, is interested in the situation where you have some Lego bricks that you somehow think of as one-dimensional. So they're sort of one by two bricks or two by two or four by two, doesn't really matter. Uh, but you put them in one layer but then you're free to move uh, the bricks left and right. So when you, after you place the bottom brick, then you could put the next one to the left or straight on top or to the right, which is not depicted here. Uh, and this is a choice that you sort of keep on uh, having. So of course there's three to the n minus one uh, choices because whenever you have a brick, there's three choices for where you can put the next one. And then he's interested in how many of these uh, buildings are, are uh, stable in the sense that when you compute the center of gravity that should fall within the base block right because if you have the center of gravity outside the base block then the, uh, the laws of physics will will tell you that the the building tumbles uh, actually you know if the center of gravity is very close to the base block then I guess you would get something which is unstable and then you would have to worry about little uh, forces at at uh, at in play. So essentially, the idea is to look at um, the situation where the building is what he calls maximally stable, and maximally stable means that the center of gravity is right in the middle of the base block. So here's an example of a maximally stable uh, block, of course. So essentially, the way to think about this is that you sort of keep track of the um, the x coordinate of the um, of the buildings, I mean, of the bricks in the buildings, and then you do um, a kind of an average on them to compute the center of gravity. And so this is done in this paper, uh, as you can see, it's fairly old, and uh, he computes these numbers until uh, twelve bricks. So he says that the number of stable bricks, that's where the center of gravity is inside the base block, and also the number of maximally stable bricks that he commutes, computes over here. And then he says, uh, he's interested in the question of what is the proportion of uh, such buildings being stable or maximally stable. So he sort of takes the number of maximally stable buildings and divides by 3 to the n minus 1, and then he's interested in what happens there. And then from looking at this data that he is able to compute, as he says, on a microcomputer, uh, he comes up with these uh, slightly annoying conjectures. So he says that the fraction of stable towers is 1 over log 3n, so that's the logarithm with base 3, and also uh, 1 over n log 3n for the maximally stable ones. And the reason this is annoying is that all logarithms are... are um, proportional, uh, so you know it doesn't really matter what logarithm you took. It would be much more natural to take the natural logarithm, for instance, because the the difference is just a constant, and you have that constant anyway in the in the proportion part of the um, of the conjecture. So what I want to show you is uh, that this is a, a wrong conjecture. This sort of fairly quickly becomes obvious from computing further than twelve. And in fact, I would claim that the reason that um, Watson cannot uh, compute longer than 12 is that he doesn't have a remember table when he makes these computations. So, of course, his computers are slower. His computer is a lot slower than the one I have here, being from 1979. But the, the point uh, is not just the computer. It's also the algorithm he must have used. It's very easy to get many more um, uh, data points and when you have many more data points, you can also fairly easily see that this is not a good uh, conjecture. So let's uh, do a little bit of this in, in Maple. All this is, is carefully written out in the book. So I would like to compute these numbers, and I would like to compute them by a recursive uh, function. 
this function, as you can see, has a, a remember option, and this is going to be very important for the runtimes. In fact, if I was to delete this, then I could still get a little further than, than uh, Watson, but not very much. So how does this work? Well, the idea is uh, that this is a function that takes two values. So one is n, which is the number of bricks, and the other one is the weight. Let me emphasize that the weight is different from the center of gravity. The center of gravity is the average of the uh, centers of gravities of the various uh, bricks. So essentially, you take the sum of the x-coordinates and then you divide by the number of bricks. In the weight, I'm not dividing by the number of bricks because that would give me a rational number and it's cleaner to work with the integers that I get as, as weights. So that's the thing that I'm looking at here. The base case of this recursive problem is suppose there's only one uh, brick, then, um, then of course if there's only one brick, then there's only one building. Uh, and when does that building have a uh, given weight? Well, the weight of the base brick, because by assumption we're putting it right on top of the zero coordinate, then so that would have weight zero. So my base case will return one if, if n is one, then it returns one if the weight is zero, and otherwise it returns zero because there are no um, towers with one brick and weight one, two, three, or minus one, and so on. If this is not the case, if n is not one, so I have more than n, uh, I have more than one bricks, then I'm going to uh, do a recursive uh, computation and I'm dividing this up in three recursive calls uh, corresponding to the three choices of putting the base brick, I mean the next brick on the base brick, one to the left, straight on top, or one to the right. Because the, the point is that, you know, if, if I know how many buildings have a certain weight, uh, with n minus 1 bricks, and I want to know how many buildings have a certain weight with, with n bricks, then I just take uh, the, the building up here and I put it in the three possible positions. And of course, if I put it in the middle position, I will get the situation here. And if I put it one to the left or one to the right, uh, I should add either n minus 1 or subtract n minus 1 because the building that I'm putting either one to the left or one to the right has n minus one uh, bricks on it. So I'm moving every, th I mean, all these bricks have been moved once to the left. So that moves the weight n minus one times one to the left and so on. So this is the, the uh, recursive procedure. And it's very easy to compute this in a little uh, for, uh, while loop where I go up to 12. And you can see that I get the same number as, uh, as uh, Watson over here. I'm only looking at the maximally stable ones. If I wanted the stable ones, I needed to, I would have to look from weights in a certain interval and add all these up. Okay, so now I'm roughly at the level of uh, Watson. And you can also see if I try to uh, plot, which is the, the thing that we're talking about this week, if I try to plot what's going on, I can already see that there's some sort of uh, uh, systematic behavior going on here. I'm using the uh, point plot um, maple command. So the only difference between a plot and a point plot is that uh, in a point plot, you show exactly the values that you have. And in a general plot, you will then take those values and connect them with little lines. And it sort of depends on what you're trying to do, uh, what's uh, cle cleanest or clearest. But in this situation, I guess, I think I could put them in if I wanted to, like, like this. No, maybe that's impossible. Uh, oh, that's impossible because it's a point plot. Okay, I'll, oops, sorry. I'll just remove point. And I wanted to show you what this looks like. Now things are connected. And uh, I mean, these little connecting lines, they might be very helpful if you're trying to plot a continuous function. But in a situation like this, uh, it's probably uh, more confusing than uh, not. So, so I will use point plot here. And point plot, by the way, is something which is not automatically loaded when you start uh, Maple. You have to use up here somewhere 
there's a with plots to load this uh, command. Okay, so so what uh, Watson did with these 12 observations is that he looked at these numbers and he says, well, that looks a little bit like 1 over x log x, uh, and then you can fiddle a little bit with the coefficients, and you get a fairly decent um, fit if you choose the constant uh, 0.58. So I did this with a little bit of trial and error. I say it's a decent fit, of course, this is, this is not very good here, here, and here. Uh, but, you know, maybe we're expecting some sort of uh, beginning behavior, which is atypical. So, you know, the fact that it seems to fit very well over here with up to 12, 10, and 12 looks promising. Right, so this is, this is essentially, I think, a very reasonable initial analysis. You compute some numbers, you plot them, and then you say, okay, this looks like some function that I know, and then you sort of uh, try to uh, tweak the function so that you hit your observations as, as well as you can. But uh, as will be fairly clear if we do somewhat more computations, let's go up to 50. So with 50, I'm not going to show you all the observations, but just to give you an idea of what they look like, they get fairly big. Right, so this is the number I have for uh, the last computation here. And if I, can, if I plot this now, you can see I still have this fairly nice uh, systematic behavior. There's a little bit of noise in the beginning. Uh, but now, uh, and, and, and even now, if I plot this with together with um, 1 over, uh, sorry, 0.58 over x log x, this looks as though it's a fairly decent uh, match. But already here, we're encountering one of the dangers of doing uh, visualization with uh, experimental mathematics, and that is that the human eye really wants to be deceived, right? So you see something like this, and this looks like, okay, they fit together. This looks promising. Um, and, you know, we're tempted to look at things and say, okay, this fits, uh, rather than uh, being uh, as... Uh, skeptical as we should and actually you know I'm doing something else which is dangerous because of course all the interesting behavior takes place down here where these numbers have gone to be quite small and because I have some values that are relatively big up to almost two then the uh, y-axis is fairly long so this compresses all the inf interesting information to a small window where it's difficult to see what's going on so what I'll do now is I will put in uh, a value m for a beginning value. I chose it to be 10, and now I will make a plot where I discarded the first 10 entries, well, first nine entries of, of the plot. And you can see now that now it's a little bit less uh, clear that uh, Watson had a good um, had a good conjecture, because I mean it's the same graph as the one that I showed you just up here, but I I cut away the uninteresting part, and that means that I can much better see what's going on. And when I do that, you can see that the, the curve here is not really consistent with the curve down here. And so of course, it might be a choice that, I, you know, the, the choice of the constant 0.58 was sort of arbitrary that would move the red graph up and down, but there's no way I can make this uh, work because the, the curvature of the, the graphs uh, simply do not match up. So you can see there's something uh, wrong about the conjecture of um, um, of uh, uh, Watson here. 